My presentation is called Standard Anorexia Dogma. Let's think differently, because we've been doing the same thing, feeding people the same nutrition protocol over and over in order for eating disorder treatment. I'm gonna specifically be talking about anorexia today. So, let's go, we got a lot to talk about. Who am I real quick? So like Doug said, my name is Michelle Hearn. I'm a registered and licensed dietitian. I'm also an ultra runner. So you guys, I practiced in the clinic for 11 years and I continue to see this just disheartening connection between what I was being told, you know, this you know, uh, whole grains, fruits and vegetables, everything in moderation and the health of my patients. My patients with diabetes, my patients with kidney failure, my patients with heart disease and obesity were just not getting better. But of course, I was being told, well, it's just patients aren't compliant. They're not doing what they were telling them to do. God, if they would just, wouldn't be so lazy and would just uh, eat less and move more, I'm sure <laughs> we've all heard that. But honestly, you guys, it wasn't until I had my own personal health decline in 2019 that I made a really big change. So I'm also the, uh, the author of the book, The Dietitian's Dilemma. So why are we talking about anorexia? You, you guys, this is a deeply personal topic to me, and before I even go any further, I do want to disclaim that there are some images here that may be triggering. I have two women at the end of this presentation. I have a very short video testimonial, so I'm not trying to trigger anybody. I'm not trying to make anybody angry, but I think sometimes change, change only comes when we get a little angry, when we get a little uncomfortable. And so if you're a little uncomfortable and a little like, ooh, during this, I promise it ends well. <laughs> so stick around with me, all right? So so this is me when I was 12 years old. This was about 10 pounds. I was 10 pounds uh, heavier here than before I went into treatment. I don't have a picture of when I went into treatment. So obviously, I just want to um, say I understand. Like if anybody here is dealing with an eating disorder, if you know or love or your friend or family has an eating disorder, it can be one of the most frustrating things, you know, telling people, why won't you eat? If you loved the family, you would eat. It's so much deeper than that. And we're going to get into that. But just validating that it is a deeply personal topic for me. When I was 12 years old, like in that picture there, I was 57 and a half pounds, and I ended up in residential treatment. So we'll talk briefly about that. I did become weight restored. Treatment saved my life, but I was anxiety ridden. I was told as a 12 year old, you will deal with obsessive thoughts around food the rest of your life. You will constantly be thinking about calories. You're probably always gonna be bloated, have joint pain and aches. And so I just decided like, oh my God, I'm gonna have to become a high functioning <laughs> recovered anorexic. I'm gonna have to deal with this anxiety. I'm gonna you know, have panic attacks. That is my lot in life. So I know a lot of people with anorexia, with eating disorders that may potentially be in recovery, may be thinking that's your lot in life. I have good news for you, stick around. All right, so what are we gonna learn? So you guys, I think it's very important that we understand how we're feeding people with anorexia right now. Because we, if you understand what's going on, and then we also have to learn what is going on on a metabolic level with people who have been suffering with acute and chronic starvation. That's where we're missing. That's where I think healthcare is missing. Because if we understand what's happening on a metabolic level, then you'll be like, Jesus Christ, we cannot feed people this diet and, they, and expect them to get better. So we're gonna talk about that. I will propose the incredibly controversial idea that a therapeutic carbohydrate restricted high calorie, animal-based, high fat diet for um, at least the initial refeeding process of anorexia and traditional dietitians lose their minds. <laughs> All right, so this is the traditional dogma. This is, these are pictures you can find thousands of images on social media. That's healthy, so is that cupcake. That's confusing. Uh, you know, the dietary dogma, and here's the thing, it sounds good on a base level. It sounds good, right? It says, hey, this person is afraid of food. This person is restricting food. We cannot ask them to restrict carbs. We can't ask them to restrict sugar. That will further set them back. It's, it, you can, most people can kind of wrap their head around that, but, but, but it is overlooking, I'm gonna say this a couple times, what is happening on a metabolic level with somebody who's gone through acute and chronic starvation? We are actually putting a roadblock in front of their recovery. So really quick, just what is anorexia, you guys? It's characterized by an extremely low body weight. It's also characterized by an intense fear of gaining weight. And most of the people with anorexia do not realize the seriousness of the condition, much to the frustration of their family, friends, practitioner, and uh, anybody who cares about them. And there's two different types, restricting, where you're mostly just um, restricting the amount you're eating and the calories, or binge purging, where you may be eating a lot and then um, either you know, vomiting or excessively exercising. Why do we need to reevaluate our treatment? Once again, we're gonna have some Im images here that might make you a little uncomfortable. And also, I thought it was very important that I have an image, this is a male. So men represent 
of the people who have anorexia, and they have an incredible stigma to overcome. So we need to make sure, doctors, family, practitioners, that we recognize that this disease can affect both men and women. Anorexia has the highest mortality rate of any psychiatric disorder out there. Let me repeat that. More people will die of anorexia than major depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, or generalized anxiety disorder. That's a big problem. You guys, for females, females 15 to 24, they, they have a 12 times higher chance of dying of anorexia than anything else, than getting sick, than getting in a car accident, than overdosing, drunk driving, 12 times higher. And the relapse rate is 50%. There's a lot of doctors, there's a lot of medical people here. How would you feel if you did a surgery and the, the fact, if it was gonna fail, was 50%? Can you imagine telling a patient that? Nah, flip a coin. We'll see, we'll see how it goes. That's incredibly high relapse rate. <sighs> Some other sad statistics, you guys. So this was a meta-analysis. It looked at 36 different studies, and what it found is that 20% of people who die of anorexia, they don't die because their heart stops. They don't die because they're not eating enough or their kidneys fail. They die because they end up dying by suicide. They cannot um, deal with what it's like to be chronically starved. When I was 12 years old and I was in inpatient treatment, the uh, doctor told me he needed to talk to my family, so I had to sit in the office. Since I'm 12, of course, I, as soon as they walked away, I snuck so I could hear what they were saying. He said, uh, I'm sorry, she has about a 10% chance to survive. And I remember at that moment, I wasn't scared, I wasn't sad, I was relieved because I didn't want to live like that anymore. Even more distressing, 20% of people who do survive, you guys, they are constantly in and out of treatment. They spend their entire life sick, and then they go into treatment, they might gain some weight, they come back, their families are frustrated. This also, a lot of the treatments for anorexia are not covered by insurance. This is a really easy way to become bankrupt or have financial issues. And finally, I will argue that 100% of people who are dealing with anorexia, and it may not even be, when I say this, you don't even have to potentially qualify with all the DSM-5 meaning you might, um, you might just be restricting calories or have eating disorder tendencies. You might not have full-blown anorexia, but they deal with racing thoughts around food. Like I said in the beginning of this presentation, I was just told that's normal. So I'm like, all right, cool. I'm going to have to become a high-functioning individual with all these issues. And we have a crisis in care. This is from a really interesting article. You guys, there are no medications approved to treat anorexia. Also, in the United States and Europe, they're like, we don't even have these specialty centers. We don't have places where people can go that are really sick. There are two short video testimonials at the end of this presentation. One of the women says she was actually denied going to a place because they didn't have defibrillators. And they said, if you die, we can't restart your heart. So, like I said, the most people who need it the most um, often don't have access. And once again, it is poorly covered by insurance. So most people don't have 100 grand to drop. I want to read this. While the key challenge in anorexia management is ensuring maintenance of restored weight, far too often inpatient or residential weight restoration is followed by a rapid um, post-discharge weight loss. As soon as people get out of treatment, they might gain weight in treatment, everyone's hopeful and happy, they get home and they drop weight. Repeated cycles may result in severe and enduring anorexia prolonged by suffering, lifestyle interruptions, and even death. So this is my question, why? Why? What is going on? Is it truly because people with anorexia just don't get better? Is it because these people are just, are you too far gone? Are they just manipulating terrible people where they go into treatment and they play the game and I'm gonna get better and when they get out, it's all a mess? I don't think so. I have a, I have a hypothesis to propose. I propose we are overlooking the unique metabolic qualities of anorexia. So what is happening? What is happening on a metabolic level of somebody with anorexia, you guys? So in the early stages of renourishment, um, an anorexic patient may have very high insulin. As Dr. Berry is, I'm gonna use this term, hyperinsulinemic. So what this can actually lead to is reactive hypoglycemia, or it's just hypoglycemia. What does that mean? And, and also, this is really interesting, people with anorexia tend not to have the neuroglycopenic symptoms that somebody um, who's metabolically healthy may have if they were low in blood sugar. So this is one of the reasons the disease is so deadly. When I was 12 years old in middle school, I was walking to class, and I remember thinking, like, oh, I don't feel so good. That's the last thing I remember. Woke up in the hospital with a blood glucose of 24. So they don't have those symptoms, and often it's just out. 
I know when I was a kid, I was like, I don't know what that means as an adult. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I'm glad I'm still alive. Um, plasma, ghrelin, and peptide YY, are, uh, peptide YY are elevated. You know, those are two hormones that say I'm hungry. Well, of course they're elevated in acute starvation, you guys, but what happens when you constantly don't respond to those hormones? Over time, we can see they actually get short-circuited. So people with anorexia, even though they are not eating, they no longer feel hungry. And so this is, this is a big one. Individuals with anorexia have um, mucosal atrophy. They may have a damaged intestinal epithelium. Your GI system is messed up after acute starvation acute and chronic starvation. That makes sense, right? Okay, so if you can't digest and absorb nutrition, how can you get better? We have to help you heal your intestinal epithelium if we expect you to have a meaningful recovery. Also, you have to have enough fat. I'm gonna use a little blinker. You, you have to have adequate fats to heal your brain. We know, we have studies that show that the gray and white matter of the brain atrophies during starvation. After you get weight restored, it's um, back to normal, it recovers. But what if you're restoring it with a standard American diet? Well, thank goodness for the standard of <laughs> for our current dietitians, right? So according to the Academy of Nutrition, the role of the dietitian for eating disorders is to work as part of this multidisciplinary team. They're gonna challenge those disordered thoughts, they're gonna teach you how to learn about food and weight and you know all that stuff, and they're gonna get you better. Great, I'm so excited, are you excited? So what does that mean? What is this diet? Are they gonna teach me how to stabilize my blood sugar? I'm gonna get adequate fat, plenty of amino acids, meat? Yay, nope. <laughs> so what they're going to do, the re-nourishment strategy for anorexia, y'all, is the same nonsense that we teach pretty much any patient. So it always prioritizes, always prioritizes carbohydrates. And an anorexic person, you are told to be healthy, you must be able to eat sugar and grains, and cookies, and candy in moderation. That is a requirement. So how much sugar are we feeding our anorexic patients every day? So once again, these are people with the damaged uh, intestinal epithelium. Their gut is messed up. So I'm gonna ask you, how would you feel if I fed you 29 to 39 teaspoons of sugar every day? 400 grams of carbs every single day. And that's just what you're eating. That's just the food you're eating, so guess what else we're gonna do? These are the standard ingredients of most tube feeding formulas. I was um, fed this when I was 12, it's the same damn thing over 25 years later. So how would you feel on top of the pancakes, and I'm gonna show you pictures, you're getting corn maltodextrin, corn syrup, canola oil, corn oil, and soy protein. Usually people with eating disorders that require tube feeding require over 1,000 calories of this a day. Michelle, there's better options. They actually have whole food-based tube feeding formulas. They do, they do, but guess what? In my 11 years as a dietitian, I got that covered by insurance twice. They are not covered by insurance, so unless you have 1,500 a day to drop, you're stuck with Jevity. I'm not just picking on Jevity, they're all pretty terrible. I got really irritated, and I wrote about this in my book. This dietitian that works with eating disorders said, you know, when they're going through the refeeding process, gastrointestinal issues, severe bloating, constipation, diarrhea, night sweats, anxiety, low blood sugar, this is all common. And I thought, okay, you're gonna, when you go from chronic starvation to being able to eat, you're certainly going to have some transition. But does this need to be common? Are we sure this needs to be common? You know, recovering from anorexia is pretty freaking hard. So do we have to make it harder? Do we have to put these people through hell? They're already going through hell. If you've been through anorexia, bulimia, binge eating disorder, if you're currently there, your loved one is there, they are in hell, we need to do everything we can to make it as easy as possible to get out. So, so this is what we're doing with our lovely standard American diet. It's another graphic from my book. So if you're constantly, you're, you know, every time you eat this, these foods, these sugary cereals, breakfast cereals, all this pancakes nonsense, you go up, you go down, you go up, you go down, you go, God, I don't know why my patient's dizzy and they feel terrible. I call on me, I know. Also, we know statistically people, and this isn't just anorexia, this is bulimia and binge eating disorder, they have a statistically significant higher risk of depression. So I'm just gonna postulate, and once again, a hypothesis, could this be it? what we're feeding people. I'm kind of makes me depressed just like thinking about it. All right, so I wanna read you some quotes from this amazing article, you guys. Um, and if you haven't, this is online, Revolution, Revolutionizing Anorexia Care by one of my heroes, Dr. Georgia Ede. She says, and I agree with her, it has always baffled me that we don't look at the nutritional quality of what we're feeding people with anorexia. 
why don't we look at the nutritional quality? She also says refusing any item is viewed as noncompliance. Well, I remember when I was 12 and I said, my stomach hurts, I can't eat anymore. Well, do you want to go outside for 10 minutes? They'll take your privileges. I don't know, that was in the 90s. I don't know if they still, hopefully they don't still do that. It's awful. And she says, unfortunately, so many of these hospital foods actually have things that will impede our brain's ability to recover. So how can we expect, once again, a meaningful recovery when we're expecting our people with eating disorders to eat this food? So this is Dr. James Greenblatt. Um, Dr. Georgia Ede refers to him in this article. He wrote the book called Answers to Anorexia. When patients say they can't eat because food hurts their stomachs, he believes them. I cried when I first read that, I'm not going to lie. And if you or anybody you know is anorexic or has had anorexia and have been told, oh, it's all in your head, blah, 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 it's not in your head. I hear you and I believe you. So anyway, he actually, shocking, will... Um, he will do digestive enzymes. He will put people on specific low-carb, higher-fat diets, and what do you know? They heal. So why? Then why are we feeding people this? If it really doesn't help or heal people, why in the world would we do it? So these are the nutrition guidelines. Are they really designed for our health? It's bizarre. I have a whole chapter in my book about this, like how they came about. It kind of looks like, like a science fiction mixed with a little politics to make it real, but it's kind of a bizarre story. It's very interesting beyond the scope of this. But when they came out, pretty much every chronic disease, you guys, has increased. You know, heart disease, kidney disease, major depression now leads our nation in um, the number one cause of disability. So are these really for health? So the Academy of Nutrition. The Academy of Nutrition is the governing board of all dietitians. They used to be called the Acad uh, Ameri Dietetics Association, American Dietetics Association. In 2012, I became a dietitian in 2009, their main sponsors were Coca-Cola, Hershey's, uh, PepsiCo, General Mills, Kellogg's. In 2019, we added GlaxoSmithKline. Huh, pharmaceutical, cool. Um, and as of 2021, these are really hard to find for someone who's, you know, they always seem to be so proud. Barilla Pasta, right, after, right before the Calorie Control Council, um, and we are literally, as of this year, all dietitians are now sponsored by the National Confectionery Association. We are literally sponsored by candy. Literally. Does anybody know, too, um, Pairwise? This is a new one. Does, can you raise your hand if you know what that is? So this is a con company that is taking fruits and vegetables and genetically engineering them to t make them taste more like processed foods. In their website, they say we are making the smart choice the easy choice. And I am sure that will have no unintended consequences, she said with heavy sarcasm. Okay. Finally, just going to uh, put this home. Continue education. Every dietitian has to do at least 75 hours of continuing education every five years, depending on which state you practice. I practice in Oregon and Washington. They have different requirements. So this was cool. I got this, and I'm like, oh, cool, regenerative ag, and it's free. I definitely want to do that. But look a little closer. Who is sponsoring this? Okay, well, General Mills is sponsoring us. Are they going to make us? What are they going to make us learn? I'm going to read this out loud. The third um, objective: participants will better appreciate the role packaged foods play in a sustainable diet, and how dietitians can better educate their patients, clients, and followers on this important topic. This is for real, y'all. Y'all can't make this up. And so what this has caused, you guys, these are dietitians. This is on diet, National Dietitian, uh, Registered Dietitian Day. I am not, not, not calling out any one particular individual. I'm calling out an entire practice that is messed up because of the dogma and because of the sponsors that needs to wake up. We've got dietitians posting with pizza and donuts. Happier D-Day, happier D-Day. This is nonsense. This has got to stop. Thank you. Hey, what do you know? People with star <laughs> severe starvation actually have a damaged level of intestinal epithelium. This was a study that was done. Studies suggest the presence of intestinal structural disturbances is one of the main complications of anorexia. Hey, we're not making this up. Also, in the Journal of Eating Disorders, they talk about uh, people with anorexia have delayed gastric motility. They can have pain and issues in any area of the intestine. It can be your stomach. It can be the esophagus. It can be your colon. Um, they also said multiple studies noted patients with anorexia report high rates of GI disorders. Yes, yes, our stomach hurts. Stop feeding us this nonsense. So this study, um, if you want to break this down, this is not easy reading. Uh, I had to get with people more intelligent than I to really break it down. But kind of like what it is talking about is that stem cells, I'm sorry, ketones are actually critical signaling molecules in intestinal stem cell renewal. 
So we put that together with what we already know about ketogenic or potentially low-carb diets, people that have IBS, Crohn's uh, disease, and other um, GI disorders, we can start to hypothesize that maybe this way of eating can actually help heal our intestinal epithelium. Also the brain, you guys, most, it's probably no shock to anybody in here that the brain is the fattiest organ in the body, right? It's made up of two, it's two thirds fat. And we really need dexohexanoic acid, DHA. I mean, that's a polyunsaturated fat, fatty acid that's been around, like it hasn't changed over evolution. Like it's so important for the brain. So it's got tons of functions, but one of the main functions is it's actually um, critical to higher thinking. We need DHA. So here's the problem. So nearly all processed foods, you guys, all processed foods have sunflower oil or soy oil. I mean, you can flip them over. You can see canola oil, rapeseed oil, all those different oils. So we're not getting very much DHA as a population. And when we take in a lot of these other processed oils, it actually interferes with the absorption of the DHA we might be getting. So what I'm asking and what I'm proposing is feeding a recovering brain of someone with an eating disorder a diet that is chiefly composed of these you know, sugars and of these omega-6 oils. Is that actually impeding long-term recovery? So there's an awesome study. I talked about this at the last M Low Carb USA. They did a case series with three people with binge eating disorder. And what they were hoping is that we're going to follow you for a year. And these were people that had not like you know, a year, this was like lifetime binge eating disorder, and they were on a ketogenic diet. And these people had complete remission of symptoms within a year. But what they found, too, is that all patients reported substantially improved mood. When your blood sugar stabilizes, when you are no longer hungry, when you start to heal, you start to reduce anxiety. You start to feel better. All right, so what do I propose? <laughs> I definitely don't have the answers, but what I would love to see as a renourishment stat, uh, strategy for individuals with anorexia would be a very low carb. And I think potentially, at least initially, it may even be like a zero carb. I think we need to remove a lot of things that potentially have irritants, anti-nutrients, so a lot of the plant materials. And it would be a very high fat, high, high, high to moderate protein. It would be animal-based. And if we are going to include any um, carbohydrates, they would need to be whole food carbohydrates. Those, like Dr. Barry says, those are uh, one ingredient carbohydrates. I don't necessarily think it has to be ketogenic. You know, and the, the two individuals you're going to hear that give their testimonies, I think it can be helpful for people sometimes to just be able to eat and not to be able to think too much and wrap their brains around macros. Also, it is very important. It has to be high calorie. This is not, and I've seen people do this, you can't, you can't decide, like, I'm going to follow an animal-based diet and eat 1,000 calories, you know? This is a very high-calorie diet. The two individuals that you're going to see testimonies, one did about 5,000 calories, the other woman 8,000 calories, so. What do we expect? Diets, diets that stabilize blood sugar, I mean, it, <laughs> That, in general, will reduce your anxiety. Once again, most of our population of, of the world, if they don't eat every three hours, they either have an emotional meltdown or they're physically like, ah, you know, we used to, the, the term hangry, right? So just stabilizing blood sugar will help reduce inflammation. We'll see that gray and that white matter in their brain heal and regenerate, but we'll be, we'll be doing it the correct way with the right fats. I also expect to see the intestinal epithelium heal. When your GI system heals, you can now absorb nutrition. So we will provide you highly bioavailable nutrition. What does that term mean? Bioavailable means my body can use it. Because <laughs> if your body can't use it, it's basically useless to you. A great example of this is like uh, iron. You know, if you eat a bunch of spinach or you eat a bunch of steak, the, the iron in spinach is not bioavailable. Uh, bioavailable. You don't use the iron from it very well. Steak is absolutely excellent. You're going to be able to utilize that iron very, very well. Also, while fats are satiating, people are like, oh, this diet's so satiating. Yes, it's very satiating. The volume is much less. And here's a demonstration of that. So if you're going to, this is the same calorie content. We have about three cups 
of this Fruit Loop cereal, and we have about three tablespoons of olive oil. I'm saying three, three and a half cups. So yes, I realize it's satiating, but for most people, especially if you've been um, starving yourself and your stomach volume is very low, it can be easier to take in less volume. And when I say that, I want to make sure, you know, when I'm talking five, 8,000 calories, we certainly work people. We would work somebody up to that. We wouldn't start them. And I know you might look at this and be like, oh my God, Michelle, we would, we would never feed somebody this nonsense in the hospital. Oh, wait, 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 hold on. All right, so these are actual pictures of breakfasts that we serve individuals with eating disorders. And for hospital people that are so proud, like I said, of this, it's very hard to get these pictures. If you're curious how I got them, send me a message. It was HIPAA compliant. It's totally fine. But um, so this is a standard breakfast we feed someone with anorexia. How would you feel if you had pancakes, milk, fruit, juice, uh, this little syrup here? This is some oatmeal and raisin bran. So what I'm suggesting, why don't we do this? Why don't we do something like this? This is another breakfast, because everybody needs juice, muffins, and French toast. <laughs> How about this? How about this? How much different do you think people would feel? How much more nutrition would you absorb? How less would your anxiety be? People with anorexia, people with eating disorders want to feel better. They want to heal. We've got to stop feeding them nonsense. Here's a lunch. Because, once again, you need cake and granola with your potatoes, fruit, milk. <laughs> this is, you guys, it's almost, it almost seems, it's laughable, we're laughing, but this is happening. This is happening. So I'm saying, let's feed them this. Or this. And finally, this is the last terrible example. You know, and once again, your intestinal epithelium is extremely damaged. Do, do we need this? Do we need this fiber and stuff right now? I'm going to say no. And so you get this tiny little piece of protein fried in something. And this, so this is, yeah, you guys know how I feel. So how about this? All right, so once again, testimonials, images can be challenging. I want to introduce you guys to Rosie. Rosie says she was living a nightmare. Lowest weight was 77 pounds, and she's 5'6". Y'all, I'm 5'6". So she, it's very clearly very lean. She says, even when I was weight restored, I was moody, I was sad, I was lonely. She said, I thought about food all the time. Even when I was weight restored, that's all I thought about. Then she discovered ketogenic diet, and she ended up trying a high-fat carnivore diet, you guys. So now I want to show you what Rosie looks like. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> guys, this is Claire. So Claire struggled with anorexia for 20 years. She says, I was living a nightmare. Claire is actually a little bit taller than I am. She's 5'7", and she was 65 pounds. So you can see her here with her son. She was hospitalized several times. She was denied treatment once because they didn't have a defibrillator, was tube-fed. She said every moment of her life revolved around thinking about food. And then she finally said, you know what, I decided it would be better for my son if I was dead. So she ended up wanting to take her own life. So again, she said, well, if I'm going to take my own life, I'm going to give it one more go. And she found keto in that letter to carnivore. And she specifically said, I liked carnivore because I didn't have to count. So. You guys, it's incredibly brave to share your own testimonies. When I interviewed both of these women, the interviews, um, they're like 43 minutes. So I'm definitely, ble no, just kidding. I can do all the 43 minutes. It's so let's, uh, if we can play the video um, interviews of these women, I'd really appreciate it. Ah. Um, and it kind of just consumed me and I just started to kind of cut people out of my life and, you know, just didn't go out and socialize anymore, just went to work and came back home and did my thing. And that was pretty much my life. It was very structured and full of routine. And I did the same thing over and over and over every day, um, I think that was that was more coping mechanism for myself. It was something that made me feel safe um, and in control. So I was I was extremely lonely, but at the same time I was like in a safe space because I could just do what I I wanted to do, or at least what anorexia wanted me to do, which was just restrict and over exercise and just be by myself so it could just kind of consume me so if I had to think back it was extremely lonely and all about keeping secrets 
My exercising was probably my biggest form of restriction. That was where I kind of differentiated that calorie deficit I was in. So um, I would always try and skip any kind of eating. Um, I never stopped eating. Um, I always made sure I did eat just to keep my parents happy, you know, because they obviously knew they picked up that there was an issue at a point. So I never stopped eating, but I would always go to the gym and completely just kill myself for like three hours. Um, so my nutrition was day in, day out the same thing. And that consisted of two bowls of cooked up vegetables. <laughs> so um, that's pretty much it. You could probably say I was vegan at that point because I didn't eat any meat. I didn't eat any protein. I didn't eat any fats. I just ate, and to be fair, the lowest calorie vegetables I could find was what I ate. So basically ended up not eating a whole lot. So um, the moment somebody kind of called me out on it, I felt like this, like just this weight was lifted off my shoulders, even though I was like 35 kilograms. I'm not sure what that is in, in pounds, but I mean, I was at my lowest weight at that time. So, and I felt like nobody realized that I had an issue, even though I knew I did. So that, I feel the best on this diet. It doesn't cause me any discomfort. It doesn't make me feel awful because that was a big thing for me when I was recovering. I constantly felt terrible. And that was purely from what I was eating. I was eating, you know, 5,000 plus calories of just simple carbs and sugar. And I mean, how good is that for your body anyway? So it doesn't help the the recovery process because it's already so difficult to going against you know the grain everything you kind of like <laughs> engraved in your brain you have to go against in recovery so um feeling awful just didn't help at all and i would say the biggest noticeable difference is just overall mood i was really unhappy even after i recovered from anorexia i was just you know an unhappy person and my mood's completely changed. Um, I also feel like I'm not so fixated on food. I always used to like kind of, and maybe that's like blood sugar issues and all that kind of stuff that comes after anorexia. But I always used to kind of wait for my next meal. I never felt satisfied because I was always cutting calories. I was just, you know, all over the place. And now I'm so satiated the whole day. Um, I know my body's working properly because my hair started growing, you know, I'm sleeping. I struggled with so much insomnia that it was actually ridiculous. Um, and just overall mood is just great. And um, I would say my mental health is like 80% better. So uh, I struggle with anorexia for the last 20 years. Um, my, my life day to day was uh, counting all the calories I was eating, restrict, restricting myself the most I could. Uh, at the worst part of the anorexia, I was eating only 100 calories a day. Um, and this lasts for six months. I lost a lot of weight, um, like 40 pounds, mm -hmm. but I was not really fatty at the beginning. And I reached down to, um, in pounds, it should be between 65 and 70 pounds uh, for 5.7 feet tall. Oh, my God. Um, uh, it was a nightmare. I lost all my muscles. I ended in the in a wheelchair. At some point, um, my view decreased a lot, and I was not able to see uh, further than one meter. In all this period, I was hospitalized a, co a couple of times. Uh, at one point, um, I was 
followed in a special uh, in a special clinic in a special hospital but but uh, at one point i was too skinny and they put me out because they were not equipped with um uh, i don't know defibrillators to put me back on if i was dead uh, the, uh it was really funny on every breakfast i had cookies with too low fat yogurt for the protein. Then uh, for the lunchtime, I had bread, pasta, a piece of lean chicken or lean fish, and vegetables, and yogurt as dessert. And sometimes they offered cheese, but most of the time I didn't want to eat it. Um, and on the afternoon, they gave me more cookies. I didn't want these cookies, but they forced me to have them. And for dinner time, it was almost the same as lunchtime. Always um, some grains, some vegetables, and some lean meat, and fruits as dessert, something like this. But my life was that nightmare that I, I didn't. I didn't want to live this life forever. So what I've done is that I kept all the pills, prescribed pills, uh, on a special box. And I was slowly dying, being malnourished, but I was waiting for the day I will decide to end the, this life because it was not living, it was surviving. And it was terrible because I was living this having a boy, having a son, and, but I, I was thinking that life would be better for him if I was dead. I, I had improvement in weeks. Now after almost five months, okay, I gained a lot of pounds, more than 20 in four months, maybe 25, but I gained my life back. I'm not cold anymore. It's in win it's winter. It's freezing outside, sometimes snowing. <laughs> or I don't mind. I don't wear gloves. Never, because I don't need gloves. Uh, I'm able to do a lot, of a lot of stuff in my house. I'm able to work full time. I'm able to go to the gym. I'm able to go to some fancy park with my boy. We are playing. I'm not focusing on calories anymore. I don't know how, much, how many calories I'm eating. Okay, a lot, already a lot, but just what I need to eat. And I, I'm able to do some exercises and I'm fine, I'm fine. I'm work out a bit and everything, but as well, I'm able to do like really quiet activities with my boy. We play chess, we play card. I'm able to focus anytime without thinking about the food. So I want to wrap this up. Like I started in the beginning, you know, I became weight restored, but it wasn't until 2019 that I really changed how I ate. In 2019, I was trying to qualify for the Olympic trials and the marathon. I had run 12 marathons, qualified for Boston 12 times. I'd run a 254. You have to run under 245. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <coughs> But all of a sudden, I started getting all these weird aches and pains, and I'm like, oh, it's cool, you know, I just, I'm just getting tired. And then I went out on a run, and I broke out in a cold sweat. And so I asked my dietitian friends, like, what do you think I'm doing? How much carbs are you eating? I'm eating 350 grams. Oh, you need more, more. So I ended up eating 500 grams of carbs a day. And as you can imagine, that didn't go particularly well. My body stopped, like I said, stopped recovering. I was sweating. My anxiety, my anxiety, oh. I used to be able to run. I could run 10, 15, 20 miles. I would go out for a two-mile run and just feel gross, sweaty, achy. My anxiety went from challenging to paralyzing. I actually was having panic attacks. I had to call into work. My wife would tell you my life was, I was making her life a lot more difficult. It was not good. So I had my come to Jesus moment. I actually came home from work, had a difficult day. A patient passed away, ended up falling asleep, woke up at 2 in the morning, felt like my entire body was on fire. And I, I didn't know what to do. I'd taken ibuprofen. I'd taken prescription medication. So if you've heard me talk on podcast, drove to my local 7-Eleven, got 30 pounds of ice, put it in the bathtub, sit in an ice bath at 3 a.m. crying. What is my life? My wife came in, 
held my hand and said, you know, maybe we should do something different. That moment I decided I was done with competitive running. I was done, I didn't need to. I was physically, emotionally, spiritually broken. You know, at that point I was 36 and a lot of people told me I was too old to be a competitive runner anyway. So I, uh, I was like, well, if I'm not running, why don't I adopt a ketogenic diet? And of course, <laughs> I could talk for another two hours about this, but that led me to a carnivore diet. My wife said, no, this is restrictive. You can't do this, no, no. So we fought about it. She was like, fine, you're an adult. Do whatever you want, you'll quit. So, and I thought, after the first week, my body felt better. But I said, well, I'm not running, you know. By the third week, actually, I came home from work. She was sitting there. She said, will you come sit with me? So I went, it's like, what's going on? And she said, I don't know if I like this way of eating yet. This is the best your anxiety has been in the 11 years that I've known you, for three weeks. <laughs> so I said, I eventually was home more because, uh, you know, I wasn't running. And she was like, she likes solace. She's like, you're annoying me, go for a run. And I was, you know, I was nervous, but I was like, I'll go jog. I ended up running eight miles, which, you know, I came home and she said, oh, you can be a recreational runner. We'll go to the trails. I said, what if I run an ultra marathon? Forget this 26 mile nonsense. How about 40 or 50? I wasn't as super excited about that. But you guys, the point is, I went from not being able to run a few miles, from not being able to get through the day at work, from having to eat every few hours. This is this past November at Tunnel Hill 50 mile. I won, I won the 50 mile race. <laughs> If you go on my Instagram, when I cross the finish line, oh, ah, I'm screaming. And someone said, why did you scream? And I was just like, oh, I can't. You, you, I, can never, I can never fully tell you. I've been to hell and back, man. But I'm so grateful. And this is why I'm here sharing this message. So, so now I'm an ultra runner. <laughs> so my message to everybody. Oh, yeah. And I also wrote the book. So um, set against the backdrop of this ineffective care, you guys, what we're doing for people with eating, eating disorders in general, and specifically with anorexia, is not working. The standard American diet is not working. I propose we do carefully planned, therapeutic carbohydrate restricted, very high calorie, high fat animal based diets, because these quote unquote restrictive diets, I actually think could be life saving. So my message to anybody out there struggling, your family, your friends, your loved ones are struggling, there is hope, there is healing, but you gotta find the right person because like I said yesterday, most traditional dietitians, you just say the word keto or carnivore or low carb and they're gonna, ah. so anyway, <laughs> that's my story. I really appreciate it. Um, there's, a, there's my work cited. You know, I would be honored if you guys are interested. My book is on Amazon. Um, I had some coffees yesterday, you snooze, you lose. So, um, <laughs> but it really helps me. It does help me. Um, I, follow me on Instagram, that's fantastic. I'm about to be doing short, um, five minute low carb videos, come see me at the table, scan the code, you can get the email to you. What else can I tell you? I think that's it. So yes, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Another great presentation. Thank really, you. really Good appreciate it. Yes, it was great. And everybody get her book. It's absolutely fabulous. I listened to it on the way to Low Carb San Diego last oh, year. Thanks. So it was really nice. Um, my one thing I wanted to acknowledge was thank you for showing that Eating disorders are not just for young women, they're mm. for older women as well. And you don't necessarily grow out of them. Yes. And, and so that's really important because there can be a lot of shame around that, a, a lot of shame. So it was wonderful to see some older, quote, older women, yes. you know, um, have eating disorders. My question to you is this, what is the role and can there be a role for either intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating for both or either anorexia or bulimia, and is there a point where you can introduce them or you won't introduce them, and are they different between anorexia and bulimia? That is a great question, you know, and I often get asked, do you fast, do you use intermittent fasting? And my, my initial response is, uh, I'm, I would much rather see people, especially with anorexia, and if you're, if you're at a lower weight, I think I, I would not intermittent fast. I think you need, just because you're gonna need so many calories, I think if there's a, you know, a point that you're metabolically healthy, you reached a, you know, a, a good weight for you, and you know, also, you know, recommending working with somebody that you could potentially intermittent fast. But I know a lot of people that say like, look, I just I eat three times a day and I'm really happy. So I think that's for some, for most people, it's pretty individualized. Like for me, I know I probably never, and you know, some days like if I run in the morning, I'm not gonna, you know, eat until later, but I would never purposely intermittent fast just because it can, you know, it can still kind of mess with your head. You know, it's not a perfect, Perfect situation, right? So, yeah. Bravo to you. Thanks. Uh, that was beautiful. Um, also, bravo to 
low carb USA because I think in these types of conferences we tend to necessarily focus on obese, overweight when we're looking at metabolic dishealth. Um, but I, I appreciate your bringing up the eating disordered crew because to me there's a bridge there and the, it's, it's both populations are malnourished. Yes. So obese, overweight, malnourished, obviously anorexic, bulimic, malnourished. So my question to you, um, and thank you for bringing up all of this because as someone who's been in your shoes, it um, means a lot to see you up there Absolutely. and helping people. Um, and doctor, now you're Dr. Squared Ben. I didn't realize you had two PhDs, but I think you might like this question. Um, one of the things that really helped me um, recover from a severe eating disorder was actually weightlifting. And I'm not saying that someone in that acute hospital, 65 pound yeah. situation should be hauling weights around, but I'm just curious if there is any kind of study of that because the, the person who has an eating disorder is deathly afraid of getting fat, gaining weight, saturated fat, yeah, all of sure. that. And it ends up that all of that is good for you. And just in my end of one, weightlifting really saved me because I was able to put on muscle and then gain sure, strength. So yeah. can no, you speak to that? In yeah, terms of I don't know of any with, study, but I hear what you're saying and I absolutely validate that. I think especially in like, you know, I appreciate that you made the point that like, not in acute recovery, not when you're like, you know, obviously as lean as the, these women were, but I feel like as you, because everybody, like if you, if you tell, you know, I, I think that's why we see such a high rate of relapse because, you know, you go in and you eat the standard American diet, you gain a lot of fat really fast and you feel awful. Well, you don't want to be fat and feel, or you're not fat, but you know, you feel fat and feel awful. So it's like, what if we made you feel good and strong? You know? So I, I think there's, a, I definitely think, I think exercise and <laughs> just like anything else, man, once you heal the brain, you know, that's another thing is like, no way of eating like will heal you from an eating disorder. But when you have that, that, that brain health, it paves the way. You can start working on your issues. You can start sitting with your trauma. You can start processing stuff. So I know for me, you know, I've had people come at me and be like, you're still eating disorder. You're a runner. It's like, it's one of the greatest joys of my life to be able to run. And I think that has helped keep me on track. And, you know, and so it's like, oh, sorry, you feel that way, keyboard warrior, you know, like, and there's a lot of trolls on Twitter. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> Well, a but, second part to that, too, would be just you can be recovered from an eating disorder, and I really appreciate your bringing up this sort of anxiety or other mental health issues that can persist, mm -hmm. because honestly, and I'm sure you all all know Tina, Nina, excuse me, Teichels, um, it wasn't until I started to not only stop being afraid of saturated fat, but actually looking to find it yes. constantly that, that I was able to stop all of this obsessive counting and worrying, yes. which I do think our obese population needs as well. It yes. just, it puts all that asleep. So I, thank thank you. you for saying that, because I forgot to say that when I got really excited about DHA is, I, I mean, we've got to prioritize animal fat. Like if I, if I ran an eating disorder center, we would have salmon and tallow and butter. <laughs> and so that would, and that would be like our most fats because that I, I've seen health transform in weeks with that really high saturated fat where it just doesn't do that with like olive oil and other things. Hi. Thank you for your talk. I love how you appreciate the bravery of the testimonials that you presented, but I wanted to acknowledge your bravery of sharing your story <laughs> with us. Thank I think you. that that really brings it home to people. Appreciate that, thank you. Absolutely. Um, and like the previous person said, I really appreciate that you bring about eating disorders <laughs> because I do feel like we really discuss fatty acid profiles, lipid profiles, and we're always talking about weight loss, but there really is a bigger picture to nutrition, and I really love that you bring that story to us. Um, I am like, uh, I am what I like to call a recovered dietitian. And <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So my question to you really relates to how you treat recovering anorexics. And I noticed that both of the diets were carnivore. Mm -hmm. And is there something truly unique about carnivore versus low carb that you yes. find with these recovering patients and yourself? Yes. Yes. That's a great question. And um, 
I was discussing this earlier, actually. I, I do think it is really helpful, and I don't, I don't have data on this, but I will just tell you my own anecdotal experience, their experience, and many people that I've talked to. I think going carnivore initially can be really helpful just because your intestinal epithelium is so damaged and so inflamed that for many people, they're gonna re they may react to, to gluten and to even vegetables, and it's just like, and you know, all this fiber and all this stuff is like hurting your system, where give it some time to heal. Like for me, I was pretty much, I was carnivore for like 30 days, and then after that, I started adding my carrots and berries, and then I realized like, oh, when I eat that, I don't feel so good, I'm not gonna eat that. But then I was able, because now I'm mostly like ketovore, right? But I think, I wonder if, I, if I'd skipped that 30 days if I would have been as successful. And I think both of these women too, like I know Rosie, like Claire is still, I I believe 100% uh, carnivore. Rosie is about 90%. But she even would, ha, has said, I wish I, had, wish I had time into the whole interview, that that was so helpful in her healing. And when you are mostly carnivore, and unfortunately, when you have to eat so much too, your you know, lettuce and all this, it takes up room. You know, I need room for that fat. I don't, I don't need room for, you know, I, I want to get as much as possible when you're in that initial recovery phase, right? So I do think that's, it is most helpful, at least initially. Thank you so much. Sure. No, thank you, Michelle. Um, I have a quick question at the end, but just to share a little background and insight similar to yours, I'm a, another recovering competitive runner, <laughs> ran, uh, you know, burning lots of carbs, um, we, and I teach uh, high school running camps, and yeah, I'd love yeah. to have you come. Oh, yeah. But one of the things uh, they did when I was in college, um, I think back in the 80s, they estimated it was probably 90% of females on, on D1 teams were anorexic or had, they called it the triad then, yeah. which is now Red S but they used to weigh in all of us every week. Um, and the, the women used to put like stuff in their pants to kind of try to up the weight. Mm -hmm. And the coaches at the time, they, called, they pulled the coaches, less than a third even knew what the three things of the triad were. And uh, 20 years later, one of my teammates reached out to me when she finally pieced it all together. She came from Europe and mm -hmm. she said this, in Europe, they never weighed any of us. We were either in shape or not in shape. You know, get a little out of shape, then you get in shape. And there was never any scale. And then, you know, then she came to America, and and they weighed us every week. And she and all the other, all the rest developed eating disorders. You know, we talked to these high school girls about this in the camp because a lot of them want want to get scholarships and like sure. you know, but we have to like fix their brain first. But what like with these recovering people, do you try to just get them to just put the scale away and and just sense it again or how, yes. how do you how do you keep them away from the scale you can. i just envisioned um you know garfield and friends like how he ships normal to abu dhabi it's like you want to ship it as far away as you can yeah because the scale will never be right it'll never be right you could lose 10 pounds the anorexic brain says i should have lost 15. god help you if you gain a pound it could be a pound of muscle and you lost five pounds of fat and it's still it would never be right so i really want them to focus on health and this is health and even people that i'm working with actually with, that are trying to lose weight i want health health because your body god if we just get out of our own way the body is so smart it wants to be healthy it wants to get better mm -hmm. so it's just like we're gonna focus on health and and usually this is the great thing about the eating you know the proper human diet you know the the carnivore diet is you feel good you start to realize relatively quickly like man you know i my body i don't i don't hurt as much like i'm sleeping better i'm, I'm not as annoyed with people you know so if you if you can get them to buy in if you and if you can get someone else on board too for like young people if you can get the parents on board like yeah we got to get rid of the scale because half of the time god i've worked with kids too like the parents are just as bad so that can be helpful yeah no thank you sure keep keep it up <laughs> well there First, I wanted to thank you so much for talking about this. I think this is like the first talk I've ever seen on anorexia and ketogenic diets, which is insane to me after watching <laughs> yours. <laughs> like we should have had this at every conference every time. Thank you. Um, but one, three comments actually, sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, first, um, carnivore may not only be helpful from the uh, just physical perspective, but also the mental perspective. At least in my own experience, I was keto for a year before I went carnivore. Mm. And I had full-blown chronic depression from when I was 11 up until two months after a ketogenic diet when it went into full remission. But then I still, it also helped with symptoms of PTSD that I was having, but it didn't fully resolve it. And it wasn't until I went carnivore that like you said, it didn't like magically fix the PTSD, 
but it helped me sit with it and really work through a lot of things and process. And yes. then um, trauma counseling after that helped to get rid of all the rest of it. <laughs> so there's yes. that perspective. Um, and then also you had mentioned foods with DHA, but I also wanted to mention that Amber actually has a presentation from CarnivoryCon in 2019 where she talked about how ketogenic diets can increase the levels of DHA also, and she could probably speak more on that. But also I had a fatty acid balance test recently, and I almost like never eat fish, <laughs> but my DHA and other omega-3 levels were in the optimal range, which oh. is really interesting. How cool. Um, so there's that. And then also, <laughs> last comment, um, in terms of regrowing the brain and stuff like that, um, ketones have been shown to be helpful with TBI because they can act as substrate um, in the brain to grow new stuff. Um, so in terms of anorexia and the atrophy, that may also be helpful, just supplying more substrate so you can grow your brain. That's so, awesome. Yeah, that's no, thank you so much for sharing that. And I also like, we could do a whole talk. Um, on my book on the mental illness chapter, I really pulled a lot from Dr. Eden and Dr. Chris Palmer, because so much happens with like neurotransmitters and, I, and it's, I don't, we don't even know exactly why. I mean, we it, it talk a little bit about glutamate and stuff that the carnivore diet can potentially be better, but it's, it's pretty awesome. Thank you. Hi, Michelle. Thank you. This is a really wonderful talk. Thank and you. I think we need to get this information out, especially since ketogenic and carnivore diets are often associated with weight loss. So people think oh, the last thing you should do is a weight loss diet, right? Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to underscore one thing that you said several times, but I, I, I think it can't be overemphasized, and that is the aspect of high calories. And, and it's not just because people need to, are in a position where they need to gain weight, but what they need to do is restore their, their body, the whole body ability to use energy. Yeah. We know about how if people go on a very calorie restricted diet, you, you make metabolic adaptations, your, your metabolic rate goes down and it's damaging. Um, and I think that, what people don't realize is that the opposite can happen. You, 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 you intake more energy and your body learns to use more energy. It doesn't necessarily result in fat gain. What it results in is more energy available for the body's use. And, and so I just wanted to re-underscore that even though you said it several times. I really, no, I really appreciate that because a lot of people will come back and unfortunately there are some people in the ketogenic and carnivore communities that, you know, that they're like, oh, I'm recovered. And you're like, you look a little rough. You know, I'm not trying to be whatever, but <laughs> you look a little skinny, you know. Um, that you can't, you can't go from eating 500 calories, a restriction standard American or 1,000 to a, you know, 1,000 calorie, you know, carnivore diet. You have to get enough calories because, like you said, your body needs to learn to use it often. Like, you know, um, you know Claire, I don't imagine Claire will always be eating 8,000 calories, but her, her diet right now, she needs this. Her body is learning, like, how to use energy, how to use it, and it's helping rebuild, and it's basically repairing so yeah, so that, that is my number one, and you know when dietitians come out, is oh, this is restrictive. That's why I wanna make sure that it's very high calorie. So yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> Just kidding. No, thank you so much for your talk. I thank you for calling out the conflict of interest that no one knows about, like people don't know what we're up against, right? Dr. Yeah. Fedke proved it, Dr. Noakes proved it. Um, I think the, the, if I don't ask the question, I'll get in trouble. So the question would be, how do us docs deal with our nutrition uh, expert, you know, our dietitian nutritionist? Oh, As an example, I, I uh, have a patient with fatty liver disease, binge eating disorder at my old practice. And so she came to me and said, how do I fix my fatty liver disease? I said, well, you know, cutting carbs, you know, and I, I talked to her about the science behind that. The next day I got called and I, I was cussed at by her nutritionist saying, <laughs> you're gonna cause her to binge more by taking away her, her cookies and donuts. And I said, mm -hmm. well, if what you're saying is true, should I tell my alcoholics to drink alcohol most of the time so that they don't binge on alcohol? Yeah. It doesn't, I, the logic just doesn't make sense. I had a dietitian literally tell me like, well, same thing. She said, well, I told my patient, you're, you know, I told the patient to, to cut out carbohydrates. Well, they cut out carbohydrates and that made them sad. So they binged. It was like, mm -hmm. Well, the problem is they need emotional management skills not to have the carbohydrates. So um, that's really challenging because unfortunately, especially in the hospital setting, like we are required, you know, to, to teach. Like I, you know, when I got my health back, like I was so excited. Everyone's going to want to learn this. And I was told, no, you can absolutely not teach this, you know, and that when I, 
So I kind of, you know, I will neither confirm or deny that I might have told patients, like, hey, I'm going to chart on this, but I'm going to tell you this. Um, and then a patient got excited about a low-carb diet, told the nurse, they told my boss I got suspended. But it's, so it's really hard yeah. because patient, because most dietitians are going to have to say that. So what I would do is I would say, you know, there's this great book called The Dietitian's Dilemma that you need to get on Amazon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Deal. <laughs> a little shameless plug there. Um, no, but seriously, you, we, you ha we have to get with low carb providers, low carb dietitians, like hook them up. There's so many, there's mm -hmm. people in here that are, that are either, and they don't even have to be dietitians, you guys. Um, you know, some, sometimes dietitians just do handouts, like a trained monkey can do that. Get with somebody that can like, you know, a health coach and say, get with this person. What you've been trying isn't working, you know, and, and my, I have 180 sided trials in there. You know, this person's been through it, has gone through it. Judy Cho has a great book out, you know, mm -hmm. get, get. Get them with a better dietitian. That's all I can say. I wish I had a good answer, but it's, I'm finding it really hard to change traditional dietitians. I mean, I, we're kind of slowly trying to do it, but if they're with a traditional dietitian, it's going to be it's going to be tough. Sorry, I wish I had easier. And how about directly with the patient when they're scared about? They've been told over and over not to eat animal fat, so they think if I eat fat, I'm going to get fat. Right? Yeah, I think so, just uh, say you know. This is, I, I always say just like, hey, you know what? Humans throughout evolution, all we did was eat meat and fat. We had zero rate of chronic disease. Everyone was healthy. We added in all these processed seed oils and sugars and now we're all sick. But it's meat's fault, you know? Like, so you have to, I try to get back to common sense first and then, you know, and also just telling people like, this isn't working, this isn't healthy, you know? Try and, I don't know, I wish, yeah, that's a the, tough one. And the other huge aspect of that is, is we know brain inflammation worsens depression, anxiety, stress, all yeah. these things. If you're a stress eater or a stress, you starve yourself to get, you know, your, your, your mental, you know, who knows? Uh, ketosis, you know, when you're starving yourself, you go into ketosis, maybe that's calming, right, uh, of the brain. And when we started, I mean, if you listen to episode number 10 of Low Carb MD, we talked about addiction, pornography addiction, yeah. like every addiction you talk about getting better on a ketogenic diet, and yeah. all these patients came up and said, yeah, it's true, it worked for me. You know, the mental health aspects of it. Well, you know, and doctor, one more thing, Dr. Westman told me too, you know, he said a low carb diet, he said, is the, mo is the most studied diet out of everything for its efficacy, it works, it's safe, and it's sustainable. So many people are like, there's no research. Ah, we're going to die. Most, the most studied. So, you know, I don't know. If patients are willing to look at the research, too, you can always say that. Like, hey, we have tons of trials on this. And it's like, you, there's very little risk for most people. So, you know what? Let's give this a try for 30 days. And if that's like, ah, let's give this a try for two weeks. Because the yeah, first yeah. week you're going to get, you know, you're not going to feel great. So let's give this a try for two weeks. So most people can do two weeks. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Hey, Michelle. Um, and, I mean, obviously we know each other. I'm Judy Cho, but I just wanted to share because I know I'm probably not supposed to share my story, but I struggled with an eating disorder for 12 years. I was plant-based. I was on every single antidepressant, antipsychotic, and this way of eating has healed me, and I'm advocating. <laughs> my question, though, <laughs> so thank you for sharing. I think it's so important to talk about mental health because ever since we're a baby, when baby cries, we give them formula and breast milk. And so all of us have a relationship emotionally with food. And it's figuring out how do we heal from that once we don't use carbs anymore mm -hmm. as a crutch. Um, so my question for you is I get asked a lot from RDs. Well, I believe in the carnivore diet, the ketogenic diet. So how do I start implementing that when I'm a RD? I get that. I get asked that a lot. And in general, in the hospital, you can't. I mean, there's literally legal issues that the hospital could get in trouble, get shut down. Like I said, I will neither confirm or deny that I was kind of telling people and charting something different for a minute. Um, but I left the hospital. You know, in 2020, I said I can't do it anymore. And so I took an 80% pay cut to do manual labor. It was good times. So buy my book. Um, <laughs> But you know, I, you know, a lot of <laughs> a lot of young people I tell that are saying like I, I'm seeing how profoundly bad this is. I'm like, you you got a few choices. If you want to go through the dietetics practice, you'll get to see like, oh, this is really bad. And then you can you can do your own thing. You can open your own business. Maybe you want to be a health coach, or maybe you want to go in the other direction. You know. So, but it you really don't have options in a clinical setting. Like I mean, um, yeah. So I usually tell people like. <laughs> do some business classes, do some health coaching classes, kind of kind of find out like what do I really want to do? Like sit with yourself. I, mean, I, I call this like radical honesty. Like what do I want to do? Do I want to do I want to speak? Do I want to do whatever? And then start making a plan because it's in my experience and I don't think in my life, maybe in my lifetime, I, we're not going to be able to change the hospital from the inside. So if you go into private practice, could someone try to take away your license from teaching something other than the my food plate? 
Yeah, it, okay. it's really hard. It has to do with do you bill insurance? Um, like right now, I practice as a nutritionist. Gotcha. You know. Okay. Glad okay. I have got to be. I'm, I've, I calculated that I'll be done paying my student loans by the time I'm 161, though. At the rate I'm going, so it's fine. It's totally fine. Um, yeah, you can. It's just there's the regulations. You know, we're under this this ethics. You know, which is which is iron, ironic, right? Like the code of ethics says we have to teach this. So, so you can't. But there are dietitians that 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 do teach ketogenic, and then you know you just have to make sure you have the right IDC nine codes, and then you're doing it. So it's possible. You just have okay. to. You have to be creative, and you have to make sure you're doing it. You know. It, you would have to do it in a private practice and in a very specific way. Gotcha. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. It's, I think it's really needed. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Amazing talk. Thanks, Dave. Without question. I have to say, I can count on one hand maybe the times that I've been truly moved to tears. Oh, thanks. And honestly, the second interview with Claire was especially moving and in large part because we get to see her change in real time just in reciting her story. Mm -hmm. she's, she's very straightforward as somebody who has recovered from an illness in explaining very factually what she was going through. And then you can see it. You can see her mood change as she starts talking about the things she's already looking forward to, spending time with her son and what she can do and how she can accomplish it. I hope you're putting that out in social media. I think that could be so helpful to so many people. Thank you. Yeah, that both of those, they're short clips on uh, my Instagram, and I'm, I'll have the full interviews like on YouTube. And Please do. Okay, cool. I did want to mention one thing. Up until 2018, and there's a reason it's 2018, up until then, with a lot of my experiments, I would play around with, you know, metabolism and how it affects my lipids. Hmm. And one particular experiment, I did carb swapping, as I would call it, and that's why I was looking at how it affected glycogen stores, et cetera. I'm not going to bore everyone with it, but I will say this. On the very last day, something very meaningful happened. At that time, I was working with uh, Siobhan, who's giving a talk tomorrow. I hope you guys will all see. <laughs> but I had this sudden mood shift like I'd never experienced in my life, where all of a sudden I got very lethargic. I got very tired, and I got very pessimistic hmm. about everything. Like, not even just the experiment that I was on, but things that were going on in my life, workloads, and all I was doing was working on a spreadsheet. And in that moment in time, I realized just how much something related to my experiment, I'm not saying it's all about carbs or anything else, but that something changed my brain chemistry to a degree that it could actually affect my outlook on life. Yeah. Since that point in time, I became a lot more aware of mental health. The reason is because after talking to Siobhan, she said rightly, now imagine just being locked into that yes. every single day every of your life. Every single day. Right, every single day of your life. And I, it just took only that moment in that one experiment to go, wow, brain chemistry being impacted by your diet. Not how you feel about the food you're eating and whether you like the food you're eating, but literally how much it gets impacted is so meaningful. And that's why I really love that you featured Georgia Ede because she has great talks on this and how it is that people who don't know or have experienced it can know how important that is. Absolutely. So thank you so much for bringing your story and this amazing talk to us. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, you know, the fact that 20% of people with anorexia take their own lives, I think, is, is really telling. You know, and, and a lot of um, parents, friends, everyone, like, why won't you just see? Why won't you just do this? It's, it's not. It's, it's truly a brain chemistry issue, I believe. Yeah. So I'm Amanda Decker. I have an opening for an RD in Middle Tennessee, if anybody knows anybody that wants to come. Come work with me. Yeah, yeah. You can do low-carb and carnivore all you want. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, but my question is, I, um, I work mainly with weight loss. Sure. But I have had multiple clients come in for me to help them lose weight. And when I walk through the door, they don't need to lose weight. Sure. It's very obvious that they're is an eating disorder there. So how would you recommend that I broach that conversation? How do I start that conversation? I'm meeting this person for the first time. Mm -hmm. They're wanting me to tell them how to pull more weight off. And I have a limited amount of time. So how oh, would you approach gosh. that? Shoot, the limited amount of time is, is, the, is the hard one. Because the, the first thing I thought of is like, I, I want to get to know you a little bit. Like, I want to know where you're at, who you are. Like, what are you, just kind of like building rapport in general. Like, oh, interesting. Okay, tell me like, why do you want to lose weight? Oh, you know, try, trying to figure out more about like what they're doing and then like what are you eating now 
you know? And then so maybe even taking the focus off like way to specifically and be like, wow, that's interesting, you know? Can I actually, can I teach you a little bit about like this nutrition? Because, you know, most people, and I've never met somebody with anorexia or any eating disorder that isn't incredibly intelligent, thoughtful, you know, creative, these are smart people. So then breaking it down, like, have you thought about eating this way? Because they're hopefully, you know, maybe they're eating plant-based or standard American or restricting, like, you know, if you eat this way, you could actually feel better, you know, and I, I never use words like weight, like you could feel stronger, never say healthy, that's a scary word, you know, so just, gosh, that's, I mean, that's a tough one, but I would, I would one, I would try to, try to build rapport as best as possible, two, I would kind of see like what they're doing right now, and then, you know, and always ask, I always ask patients, is it okay if I tell you a little bit about like this way of eating that's working for a lot of people and it's just really good for your system, do you, and also just 90% of people just in general have anxiety, do you deal with anxiety, how's your energy, oh, I'm tired, I'm anxious all the time, wow, this can really help, so taking the focus maybe off the weight, and you're, so you're kind of get them excited about something else potentially, and then, you know, Hopefully, <laughs> that's a good way at least to get going started. Hey, Dr. Hey, ben. hey Michelle, great job. Thank uh, you. Little advice on your talk. Maybe you want to get a little more animated and enthusiastic. <laughs> you know, just from I know, experience. very monotone up here. Yeah, thank you. you know, thank you, sir. Off the top of my head, that's what okay. came to mind. Uh, one other comment. Yeah, you had to drop an F, F bomb, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Another comment about Feldman. He cries a lot, so don't. <laughs> Okay, but uh, I had a question. Any studies or any knowledge that you have about the body recomposition from an anorexic state to a healthy state? And I'm saying body composition meaning muscle, fat. Do you know what the trajectory might be as far as what kind of tissue you're add, adding at what rate? I mean, is this too much in my weeds? No, or I, I, hear, I absolutely hear what you're saying. Um, I don't know of any, because so many of the studies, they, they just say weight restored, you know, or they'll have the specific like pounds gained where they don't say muscle versus fat. Mm -hmm. um, it would be my, my intuition and probably my hypothesis that so a lot of the weight gained is, is fat mass. And once again, because you're getting so yeah. much sugar and so many calories and relatively little protein. Um, I would, it would be, I would love, you know, my perfect world, once again, we would, we would, everybody would have a, a scan, a muscle fat, and we would feed you a very high fat. High and and diet. also skeletal. I mean, I, that would be an interesting, yeah. because I would assume some of this weight is going to be, you know, like bone density, uh, osteoblasts, right? yes. upregulation, you know, meaning bone building stuff. Yeah. Uh, so that to me, uh, another comment, um, you know, you're talking about mental state and stuff, and I've worked with, in fact, my second PhD, I did a lot of work uh, with anorexics, bulimics, and stuff like that, um, and how exercise affected that. And one of the things I think suggested, anyway, you could tell these mostly gals, I, I haven't seen an anorexic guy in my history, but anyway, um, is that it's, it, would you be okay with putting on muscle? Yes. Okay, that's great. And, and don't forget, muscle weighs, you know, three times as much as fat per, per density. You know, that's a way to kind of, okay, that sounds okay. They're not afraid of that a little bit, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and the other thing is, as far as the mental thing with this eating, um, there's a very uh, famous study done at Duke with exercise, higher intensity exercise, and Zoloft hmm. in women. Okay. okay. Uh, and they did a six or 12 week deal, one with Zoloft, one with exercise. They got the same performance out of it. You know, when they, they give you the, the scores, how do you feel? Are you less depressed? And also chemically, they got the same exact response. One did no drugs and one did a exercise, drug. Yeah. Okay. I mean, and that's a pretty famous study out, out of Duke. Um, I had one other thing to say, but I'm old and I'm, I forget <laughs> stuff. Uh, no, but, that's. An, I really appreciate you brought that up about bone too, because I, I yeah. also worry that the standard American diet is is either not. It certainly isn't helping bone. You know, when I was yeah. 18, I was diagnosed with osteoporosis. Of so course, it's not, not great. Yeah, of course, that's going to happen. Yeah. And so, just a, a, and on my osteoporosis talk is, whenever you increase muscle, you increase bone. Whenever you lose it, they both sarcopenia, osteopenia, are just correlated hand in hand. Okay, so when you increase protein synthesis in the muscle, build muscle, you increase protein synthesis in the bone, which is basically a protein matrix, okay, that becomes more dense and can hold calcium more readily and you can leach it less readily. Mm. That's what osteoporosis really is, so. Okay. Thank you. Great Thank job, you, Dr. Kid. Thank you. Appreciate it.
Again. You need the mic. Yeah. Okay. Oh. I have a couple questions um, from the virtual online uh, viewers. Right. Uh, thanks, Michelle. Um, in, in fact, there's actually one here who was in reference to osteoporosis as it was coming up. And let me just uh, ask quickly that one. Um, how often do you see osteoporosis in and people with eating disorder, uh, very mm -hmm. often, especially young yeah. people, yeah, because yeah. I mean, a lot of a lot of teenagers um, may never get their periods or are amenorrheic, um, you know. Unfortunately, I mean, you have to have, you know, you have to have enough enough body fat, so you can, you know, a lot of times they'll be giving these people calcium supplements and vitamin D, and it's like, I mean, that's great, but it's not going to do anything unless you have enough enough fat. So the good news is that especially when you, if you're younger, you know, you're you're building bone until you're 30. And so you can certainly reverse osteoporosis if you're very young. And, you know, I know they have like Fosamax and some other drugs that would be out of my scope. Um, potentially you could, you know, build bone as you're older. But yeah, when I was, when I, was uh, I think 17, I was diagnosed with osteoporosis in my spine and osteopenia on my hips after I fractured my hip. Awesome. Um, you should read about it in my book. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, I would love um, to. <laughs> but no, but seriously, but I was able, as I, I had to, you know, I had to gain more weight and I had to, you know, start, you have to start having periods. So I, I do see it a lot, but especially for younger people, it is potentially reversible. Good to know. Thank you so much. Um, C Carlos, uh, sorry, that was from Carlos. Um, okay. Kyle was, did, we, did you touch upon what you do with um, vegetarians? And eating disorders. <laughs> Ask them to go somewhere else. No, just kidding. <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm with I'm with Dr. Barry on this. I animal-based nutrition. The most cited um, works. The most clinical trials work cited of my book is my plants versus animals chapters. It's just we just cannot. Every species has a species-specific diet. I have a new puppy. I love him named Jackson, and I also have a tortoise. The tortoise is fed very differently than how I eat as a human versus how Jackson eats my dog. So, you know, unfortunately when you're eating a lot, it, it, if you're a vegetarian and you're eating eggs and seafood and cheese, that's totally fine. But if you want to be a vegan, in my experience, it's, it's dangerous for your bones, it's dangerous for your hormones, it's dangerous for your weight. I mean, it's, I, I, don't, I don't believe that way of eating is good or sustainable at all. So I, I personally wouldn't, I, I wouldn't work with somebody like that. It's just, I don't, I don't think that's gonna develop into a healthy human. That's that's my experience. Yeah, good. Okay, um, Nick Norris is online. And, Nick, uh, <laughs> he's commented a couple of times. Um, he was talking about DHA and the half life in the brain and it have being years long, like two and a half years long. Um, but um, he's also said Michelle mentioned the triad, i.e., female athlete triad, now renamed REDS. And part of the triad is low bone mass, so that's in the same relation. But it's just a comment, not oh, a question. Thanks, Nick. 